thank you very much uh, to the organizers for putting together this nice workshop. It's really been an exciting week. And um, also a very intensive week, I think, for all of us. So I'm particularly excited that you are here today. <laughs> so it's a morning talk on the last day. So um, I hope it will be a bit at least interesting and entertaining. Um, I want to talk about a couple of papers that we wrote with a couple of my uh, co-workers. Um, so it all started with um, Marco Torgosa and Marie-Therese Wolfram a couple of years ago. So Marco was visiting uh, me in England. He was doing his PhD with Giuseppe Toscani in Pavia. And uh, yeah, of course, was part of his, his master uh, to, to have some experience of research abroad. And actually, it was a very fruitful trip. Uh, and uh, we could write a paper together with Marie. Uh, and then somehow this uh, model did not, um, we did not uh, have enough of this model. So we continued with a student of uh, Marie, uh, Michael Fischer from Vienna. Uh, and then there were some more analysis questions that we had with this model. Uh, so we teamed up with Josephine Evans, who is uh, also at Warwick and assistant professor. Uh, and um, yeah, so, so I want to talk about the kinetic ELO rating model for players with dynamical strength. And I will try to explain a bit what this is. So today in the week, we have seen many agent systems a lot in biology, in sociology, crowd dynamics, opinion formation. Myself, I have also worked on wealth distribution before. So, but uh, all these things, of course, we you know share uh, similar features that we have a large number of agents. We don't want to follow the trajectories of each single agent necessarily because we're more interested in aggregate quantities. Um, we don't, uh, we like to study things starting from a microscopic perspective and then in a statistical sense, uh, see the dynamics and hopefully see some interesting behavior emerging or some self-organization emerging. And we very much like tools from kinetic theory. And so this is also kind of the underlying framework in this talk. But I want to talk about something different. Uh, I want to talk about uh, not sociology and not uh, biology, but about rating for zero-sum games. So zero-sum games are games where um, it's not uh, cooperative, but uh, one has to win and the other has to lose. And the very famous example for this is, is chess. Um, and uh, maybe 50 years ago or so, uh, a rating system was developed by Apat Elo to determine the relative skill levels of players uh, in chess. And this has later been also be adopted for online gaming, for table tennis, uh, and initially was more for uh, pairs of players, but then also was adopted for multiplayer sports, uh, like football or basketball. And I think the really... Uh, major breakthrough for this kind of system was when FIFA adopted this for their world ranking in football. So they had their own system before that also had some idea that you would gain more points in the ranking um, if you win in a very big tournament and then supposedly strong uh, players. But they adopted also uh, the system and this so is really a major breakthrough, of course. So the idea is that each player is assigned a rating number, and this, this changes as you play games. And the difference in rating between the players should somehow predict the outcome of a game. And the players with same rating who play against each other should have similar probability of winning or loses. And um, Then also, if you win against a very strong player that is much stronger than you, you should move up faster in the rating. Uh, if you win against a player that is supposedly not very skilled, you should gain only very little because it's somehow expected that you win. Um, and Arpad Elo himself uh, did not give a theoretical justification for this, but uh, based it more on numerical simulation and his own very good understanding of what happens to the system. 
And um, it was until 2015, actually, that Juncker and Jabal looked at this um, in a continuous setting where they uh, introduced as independent variables the strength and the rating of players. The strength in their model is fixed, but it's not observable. So we cannot put a device to a person and check what is their uh, player strength. And the rating is something that should be computed over time, it's something that we can see, that we can list in tables, uh, and should be variable. So the idea is that, similar as in kinetic theory, we have binary interaction between players. You have the rating of the players before they meet. Um, then you have a random variable. So in the simplest case, uh, there's only winning or losing, so minus one or one, the score result of the game. You can think also of having maybe the whole interval if you want to think of things like football, where it can be important uh, how many goals you score, what is the goal difference. So this is a random variable. And then the adjustment is moderated through this function b um, that is applied to the difference of the ratings before. And this is not a linear function, but it's usually something like a hyperbolic tangent, so that you have this effect that if the differences are very large, that the change, uh, the marginal change is getting smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. And the main, main underlying assumption in this model is that you assume that on average, the outcome of this game is predicted by that function applied to the difference of the strength of the players. So the strengths you cannot observe, so it's not something uh, you know, but you assume that the outcome is predicted by these strengths. And then, of course, there's a constant for the speed of adjustment that you need to, to choose. So that depends a bit. Um, if you are FIFA, you want to, to choose this, this parameter to see how quickly the rating changes over time. Um, so the idea, again, to summarize, is that the player with a high rating wins against the player with a low rating, for example, then the ratings will change very little. And if a player with a very low rating wins uh, against a master player, then, of course, he will move up a lot. So the question is, of course, is this a good rating system? And what does it, what does it mean? Is it a good rating system? Well, do, in some sense, at least, um, these ratings converge um, towards the fixed strength over time? And the answer of Juncker and Jabin is uh, somehow a bit more complicated. It's, it depends depends on various things. So um, they showed that um, in their continuous model, you can have a distribution now of players F that depends on the continuous rating and time. And this satisfies um, this kind of transport equation with a nonlinear, non-local uh, coefficient here in front. And also you see here this function B appears with the differences of uh, the strengths and the ratings. And then there's also this interaction function um, which gives you a way to say who plays against whom. Yeah. Because um, in many sports, the world leaders don't necessarily want to play uh, against me. Yeah. So, because they want to play against each other, yeah, it's more challenging, they don't want to waste their time. Um, so usually you will have this function restricting the interaction to something that is local in the ratings. Um, so if you have the situation that everybody plays against everyone, then you would just set W to one. Uh, and the result of your Juncker and Jabin is that in this setting, the ratings converge exponentially fast to the intrinsic strength. So this is good. Um, if you have only local interactions, so if only people um, that have, let's say, similar ratings play against each other, Unfortunately, the ratings may not converge. No? And so it's really a bit of an intricate question. Um, when we saw that paper, we immediately became quite interested because um, there also, was also a literature on kinetic models of learning. 
And for us, um, of course, the idea that players have a fixed strength and don't learn over time uh, seemed not to be very realistic. So the idea was for us to introduce uh, another uh, variable in here, and or not another variable, but say that this strength should actually be a variable, and we should be able to learn through playing. Mm -hmm. So clearly, if we encounter <clears throat> other players, uh, we should learn, be able to, for example, learn from our previous mistakes. So the idea uh, would be to, to use the same model as before for the rating and introduce some, some update for the learning. Um, and as usual, this will be, so we will learn not in this model here uh, through the binary interaction in the game. So it's not uh, here that we go away and, and study and then we come back to the game uh, and then we adopt our rating. So it's somehow through the, the playing that we learn. There are some random changes. Um, and then there are some, some changes that are depending on the intrinsic strength with the idea that um, different effects could play a role uh, in this um, adjustment of your strength. And of course, this is a bit ad hoc and you have to um, consider a bit what could be useful effects for learning. Um, so one thing we wanted to, to introduce is uh, just learning by interaction. So just through the playing, uh, we learn and we learn more if we meet somebody who's stronger than we are. Yeah? We will maybe not win. It doesn't depend whether we win or we lose, but we will see um, some tricks, let's say, that we can adopt ourselves. So possible choice to introduce this is this function here. So it's actually a very positive view on life because remember this is something like the hyperbolic tangent. So this is always positive. So we assume that we always, everybody will learn something. Yeah? Maybe very little, but we are all improving. So probably uh, we watch too much Star Trek in the past. Um, so it's a very positive view and uh, the other effect is gain and loss of self-confidence. Confidence. Um, so they should be they're somehow expected to win against players uh, with lower ratings. Um, they're kind of expected in that model to lose against players with stronger ratings. So if the opposite happens, they should have a negative a hit on your psychology. Um, so we assume that there's a gain and loss uh, in these situations. So depending... Uh, if the outcome is not in your favor, um, and then again, this is moderated through the hyperbolic tangent, you will win or lose more. And uh, we can consider both of these effects together. And um, yeah, and we can do this in a plot here. Um, so this adjustment is a bit moderated towards the case where ratings are, are very different. So the, the change is bigger somehow in, in uh, people who have similar, similar strength. Some features of this interaction are then, then on average. So, so this is taking the average with respect to the random variables with a PHP in this model. So on average, um, the sum of the ratings is preserved. Um, since we had that positive view that we all learn, the total strength is not preserved, but there's a, a growth over time, and this be for numerics and so. And also the analysis, we uh, should take this into account some later because of course our whole distribution will have the tendency to drift and roll over time. But still we, we like that, that idea. Um, and then we can, uh, as, as we have seen a couple of times already this week, we can uh, look at uh, the associated Boltzmann equation uh, in the limit. Uh, here in the weak form, yeah, many of you know the Boltzmann equation. Uh, it's a bit of a complicated equation. Mm. And uh, some test functions phi here. Uh, and on the left side, you have the, the time change of the density. And on the right side, you have this collision operator, which measures your gain and loss uh, in these variables. Mm. This is a very complicated equation. So uh, one very often prefers to go to a Fokker Planck type limit. So we following the usual um, limit um, of grazing collisions, we 
uh, rescale time and we let this um, um, adjustment parameter tend to zero at the same time as the variances of the random variables tend to zero by keeping that ratio sigma square over gamma fixed. And then, yeah, we obtain a Fokker-Planck equation, which is um, now a bit more complicated than in Juncker and Jabin's case. So uh, for them, they only had this, this part of the equation. Now we have another transport term that adjusts the strength. And since we had some, some randomness, we also have diffusion in the strength. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and you have these coefficients are all these non-local operators. This moderation function, uh, this interaction function W appears. If you set this to one, of course, things simplify a bit, but still is is highly non-linear, non-local uh, Fokker-Planck equation. So it's quite complicated in a way to, from an analytical point, but also from a numerical point of view. Um, since we have this constant shift in strength, this is a bit inconvenient for numerical purposes. Um, so the idea was to, to compensate uh, uh, this and look at a, um, a shifted density. So we shift the density back in time so that on average, uh, the strength is, is preserved. Then of course, structurally, the, the equation is the same, but we have a little bit uh, different uh, coefficients here. Mm -hmm. But in this way, we can use kind of a fixed computational domain in our numerics and um, don't have to deal with that, with that drift. So the first thing, of course, was that we wanted to ask us about uh, the well poseness of that system. So for that purpose, it seemed uh, reasonable to, to look at this on a, on a bounded domain. So we had to supply this with some, some boundary conditions, <clears throat> homogeneous Neumann boundary conditions. We have some initial conditions and um, we have some, some domain in R2 uh, where our ratings and our strengths live. And then we could show um, that under certain conditions on the regularity of these uh, coefficients, uh, there exists a weak solution of that Fokker-Planck equation satisfying certain L infinity bounds um, and of course, the, it can grow over time, but it's, it's uh, uh, still bounded on finite time. Um, so this, the proof of this theorem is more like a classical uh, PDE proof. Um, so remember that we one issue here is that we have diffusion only in one of the variables. So it's incomplete uh, diffusion. So the first thing that we do is we um, look at the regularized problem where we add a Laplace in here with a small parameter. Um, and also, we look at a truncated problem. Um, then we set up a fixed point operator for the... Um, so we look first look at the linearized problem, then set up a fixed point operator. We try to derive an infinity bounds. We use Lira Schauder's fixed point theorem. And then somehow the tricky bit is to uh, perform a, the limit of the vanishing regularization parameter to zero, so that uh, to, to, of course, your bounds have to be independent um, of that parameter to, to do that. So it's a bit tricky, but in the end, you are able to, to pass uh, to the limit of the vanishing regularization parameter and uh, pass to the limit in the weak formulation of the equation. So it's a bit like classical proof. And um, so positive, we, we have a solution. Uh, so course, we asked ourselves what happens to these ratings now over time. Um, and actually, this question is much more complicated to, to answer analytically. Mm. So the energy um, that we look at is this quadratic energy. Mm. So we want uh, the, remember, we want the ratings, ratings to approach the strength over time. Um, in general, not much can be said. If we put W to 1, um, we can compute this derivative and make some manipulations. We uh, end up with several integrals. Um, if you assume that your G has a specific shape at some time in the future that is maybe concentrated in one of the two variables, so a delta in either rho or r, it can be argued that uh, these, uh, all these things will be, uh, this contribution of these integrals will be negative or zero, so you would have some decay. 
but you will always have this from the diffusion, um, this thing which is positive. So it's not really, it's not really an analytical result. It's just a, a feeling that it seems to want to converge, but is not a proof. And it seems also to show that since this is always positive, it will not converge to uh, the identity. Yeah? Uh, so that really rho, uh, uh, R converges to rho. Because in principle, in, a, in, the, uh, in the plot, you would want things to concentrate on the identity line so that for every player, um, their rating converges to their strength. Uh, this will surely prevent it. So uh, what you maybe more expect is that you have some accumulation towards the identity, um, hopefully. So we looked at this um, numerically. Um, so first we did some simulation of the microscopic system. So a direct Monte Carlo simulation of the system. And here we can look at some kind of numerical steady state. So in a long-term um, simulation. You have here the kind of the top view uh, onto that domain. Here is the strength, and everything is uh, is now here rescaled uh, to the unit square. So it's of course the ELO rating for chess uh, numbers are much higher, but it's mathematically it doesn't concern us too much. We're on the unit square. These are the ratings versus the strength, and we see some accumulation here along the diagonal, but it's more like a cloud. That, that forms, um, and even in the case uh, with no diffusion, we see this. If we have diffusion, small diffusion, then it becomes even more, more pronounced. Yeah. So, so in that sense, the mechanism seems to work, but is not perfect, yeah? because of course you could have some people who have um, higher strength uh, and lower rating, mm -hmm. but at least on, is not completely off. Then we also compared this with the simulation of the uh, continuous Flocker Planck equation. And yeah, you get very similar pictures. So here with diffusion is a bit more um, diffusive, but you also have this kind of cloud uh, around the, uh, the diagonal. So that's not too bad. This is in the situation, both of these is in the situation that everybody plays against everybody. So remember for the simple model of Juncker and Jabin with fixed strength, then they could actually prove that you have convergence, uh, but only in this all play all uh, case. We can look also at these energies over time. And yeah, you see really something like exponential decay uh, in, in both cases with or without diffusion. So maybe not, not completely unexpected. You see that, I mean, it's very small here. It really goes asymptotically almost to zero, here tries to approach some other value as uh, as time grows. You know? Close to zero, but not zero. But we've seen it's more like a cloud. It's not, not really a straight line on the diagonal. Um, so now we want to look at a bit more interesting situation that you have competition only between groups um, with similar ratings. And then a uh, bit the tricky question appears, uh, it really depends, things depend a bit on your initial configuration. Because if you want to uh, think again of chess, if you have a new player, you have to assign them an initial rating they've never played before. You don't know their strength because you cannot measure it. And so you have to assign something. And um, you will see actually in this model, it depends again a bit, but it is somehow is an intricate thing to choose the initial rating. If we choose the initial ratings wrong, things can, can go very wrong. So let's do something that is somehow not a good choice. Let's say we have one first group um, where all players have a rating of 0 0.2 on the unit interval, so they are rated quite weak, but actually uh, their strengths are normally distributed around three quarters. You know? So really our initial choice is very poor. And then we have a second group where it's the opposite. We give them a very high rating initially, and uh, we just say their strengths are uniformly distributed on the unit interval in row. And remember, in our model, we have some, some parameters for the learning. Yeah, so uh, we switch off um, this psychological effect. Uh, we set this uh, coefficient to zero, so we only have the, the other learning effect. 
Uh, what we get then uh, numerically over time, we don't get convergence to the diagonal at all. Um, we have the two groups, uh, and they really uh, remain, they seem to form some, some lines, um, but they're not accumulating along the diagonal at all, uh, because there's not enough interaction uh, between these two groups, uh, because they're not, uh, not playing against each other. Um, if we now, yeah, so it's clear that assigning initial ratings is really a delicate issue, and it's important to do that right to, for the rating to be credible. Now we do the, choose the same groups, and we switch on this uh, psychological effect um, that you win or lose uh, strength uh, depending whether you are losing unexpectedly or winning uh, unexpectedly. And then we see, actually, we get some nice accumulation also with these very different groups. Yeah, so it's quite interesting. And so in this sense, um, this psychology helps us to, this learning mechanism leads to convergence of these ratings, at least here in the numerical simulation. Then uh, one thing I was quite interested in, and we... Uh, wanted to bring this somehow in that you could also cheat in, in games. Yeah? So uh, sometimes in football, but also in chess is more difficult, I guess, but uh, you could try in multiplayer sports, you could try to bribe the referee and uh, supposedly has happened. Um, there could be doping in, in sports where that, that helps. So the question was, um, can we somehow see this? And of course the the cool question that we are not addressing here would be somehow that if you were looking on game data, would you somehow be able to uh, filter out um, the games that look suspicious for, for foul play and then maybe you could investigate uh, more closely. So we're not doing it here, we just wanted to do some forward simulation. Um, so we took one player whose, um, whose outcome of the game is always biased in, in their favor. Um, and uh, yeah, of course, we also see then uh, what happens. So we only do it in the, of course, in the microscopic simulation. Uh, and we see that all the other players, uh, for them, they're kind of the fair players. Things accumulate across the, the diagonal. Uh, their ratings converge to their strength. But this guy uh, has cheated and has a bit of an unfair advantage and has a higher rating now than he's supposed to have for his strength. Yeah, then with Michael uh, Fisher a bit later, we and Marie again, we um, wanted to really extend this to multiplayer sports because um, um, people like chess and many mathematicians like chess, but the general public really likes football. Um, so I was really keen for for Michael to uh, to extend this to something like football. It proved actually to be very difficult because we started a bit over ambitious. Uh, that we wanted to have teams, and then you could select for each game a lineup, uh, and then there was a question how to bring that in that model, maybe how to select players in for the game. Um, so in the end, uh, we resorted to uh, just introducing not the detailed configuration of each team, but only the mean and variance of the team's strength. So now we don't have the strength of one player, uh, but the average strength of the team's players and the variance of the team that play a role. And then there's a similar model. I don't want to go into much uh, detail here, just briefly present this. Uh, and then again, uh, Michael did some simulations, microscopic versus microscopic, and tried to prove as much as he could prove about the long-time behavior. Um, it's, it's a bit interesting, um, the results, um, in that sense that uh, for the other model, we assume that we want to have um, accumulation across the diagonal. So here, you have some accumulation, but it's more uh, across a slightly different line. Um, and then again, um, the setup, initial setup um, of the, the initial configuration uh, played quite a, a big role. So. Um, so actually here he tried to use some some real data, uh, rescaling some strength data of, of Brazil and Germany. Um, I mean, this was after the World Cup, so um, he was keen to to do that. Uh, but again, you see some some uh, 
some accumulation here of the, the other players along a straight line, and then uh, Germany and Brazil are um, somehow um, a bit underrated for their for their strength. Okay, but maybe more mathematically more more interesting and challenging is the um, the second extension. Um, this comes back a bit to the point um, that you have incomplete diffusion. And um, of course, ideally, uh, you would like to understand also analytically the convergence um, to equilibrium better. I mean, numerically, we see some something that looks like exponential convergence. And um, together with Joe, uh, Joe is really an expert uh, for hypercoercivity. Um, when she joined us at Warwick, we felt, oh yeah, this is the right moment for us to uh, to revisit this this equation. So, uh, so it's a degenerate Fokker-Planck equation with this incomplete diffusion, and uh, but it's known that such equations frequently, despite not having coercivity, you still see exponential convergence uh, to equilibrium, although you have this incomplete diffusion, and this was the term. Uh, Sorry, the term hypercoercivity was was coined by Villani in two thousand nine nine to um, to um, reflect or give give a name to this behavior. Um, many people have uh, worked uh, very hard in this area since since then. Is a quite an interesting phenomenon. Yeah, you have diffusion, um, but then you have transport in the other variables, and so it's an intricate. A relationship between the transport and the diffusion that happens there, um, and um, there are many papers now, um, but it's, it's still very hard to, to prove things. There are results for for linear Fokker-Planck equations. I mentioned here these papers by Arnold and Alp and Achleitner, and there are, there are other many other papers um, that I don't list here. Of course, here we have a very nonlinear equation, so this unfortunately did not help us these results. Um, and then um, there are other papers where people have some knowledge about the steady state. So they either have um, a closed form representation, an explicit steady state, um, or they have some very good bounds on a steady state. And then uh, you're able to prove something. Usually the idea is always to, to work in some uh, reweighted topology that takes into account um, the, your knowledge about the steady state. Uh, again, here, we don't know what the steady state is. Of course, we know we would like it to be uh, the diagonal, but we have seen in the numerical simulation it's not. And it's also not uh, something like a simple Gaussian or so. Uh, it's some, something like a stretched Gaussian or something that is diffused along the diagonal. So it's, it's there we don't know. So these results uh, we simply cannot use. Um, and... Of course, we were very bold when we uh, started out with this, and we said, oh, yeah, we will do something and prove something. Um, that proved to be uh, very difficult, and we became much more modest very quickly. Um, so the idea is always to study um, uh, energies which are reweighted with some, some suitable function. Um, ideally, you would want to take something that is depending on your steady state. If you know that, you can do it. So that's great. We don't know it. Um, so what, but what we could do, at least for numerical simulation, we could compute a numerical steady state and, and plug that in and look at these energies to see what, what happens then. Uh, another idea is somehow to choose a good reweighting um, that depends then on, on the, the independent variables and some parameters, and you try to choose these parameters in such a way um, that you can uh, can prove some bounds. So, but first we did some numerical simulation to understand a bit uh, how the behavior looks. So, the left picture is if we chose this reweighting function and do our simulation. So we don't know the steady state. We just choose different parameters here, and you see that uh, depending on the choice of your parameters, you always have some. Um, some decay towards the steady state, but it can be very slow, and it has this kind of staircasing effect. Yeah? So, and this is very a common feature also for for this 
uh, hypercoercive uh, equations. Yeah, so it's not like nicely um, with uh, the same rate decaying over time. It's decaying, but uh, somehow a bit faster, a bit slower, a bit faster, and so on. Um, if we take the numerical steady state um, in that energy, we see uh, we almost get a, like a very uh, nice exponential curve. Um, so if we had a, a probably explicit uh, numerical steady state, it would look even nicer. So, um, so the idea is really to, to find the right uh, topology, and then you hopefully will be able to prove something. But it's very difficult. Um, the sad, uh, sad note is that we did not succeed to, to, prove, uh, to prove something here. Uh, we became much more modest uh, and uh, spent time on proving that actually a steady state of this equation exists. And uh, even this became quite a, a technical uh, proof and a, quite a technical paper. So I don't want to go into a lot of detail here today, um, but um, it involves several steps. Of course, as you can imagine, initially you want to use some, look at some linearized equations. Um, so where we replace uh, the F that usually appears here uh, in these uh, non-local operators uh, by some given mu. And then you want to define uh, a mapping that gives you the unique steady state. Of course, you have to prove that there's a unique steady state to this linear equation. Then you want to show that this, this operator or this mapping is well-defined. Um, and also this, in this case, became quite uh, involved and uh, uh, Joe did a, a great job there. So um, is the pro our proof is based on Harris's theorem. So it's a bit of a probabilistic view on things. Um, also allowed to obtain some moment estimates. So moments always reweighted with this uh, function, with this function here. Yeah. Of course, in the analysis, we have, have nothing else, but this function where you suitable chosen parameters. Um, then we need to show um, that actually the, the set of measures uh, under this, uh, under the action of this map is, uh, is conserved or remapped in that in a convex set to prove that G is continuous in that strange topology, which was also a bit uh, um, intricate. And then we were able to apply, apply Schauder's fixed point theorem to conclude that uh, a steady state exists to the nonlinear equation. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we are kind of still intrigued by the equation, but we have discussed this also with, with many experts um, and probably is not a good idea to directly attack this equation uh, if we want to prove something about equilibration, but maybe um, look at simplified models where just have switch off uh, uh, maybe one of these terms yeah? and then understand what happens there. And then, yeah. so, but this is still, still work uh, for the future. So I'm um, actually quite quick today. So I'm already summing up. Um, so I introduced you to some uh, rating systems uh, for zero-sum games. Um, we saw these results of Juncker and Japan. Then we saw our model that introduces learning um, into the model. Yeah, we can derive Boltzmann equations, Fokker-Planck time equations. We can study the well-posedness, uh, prove the well-posedness of this Fokker-Planck equation. Mm, studied a bit numerically the long time behavior of uh, the system. And then there are several extensions, the one with the uh, teams of players, and then some of the numerical aspect, uh, the analytical aspect of the equilibration, where we only have that kind of preliminary result that a steady state exists. And uh, one maybe can have hoped that uh, over time we will be able to prove uh, also more. Um, so I want to mention again that assigning initial ratings is delicate. We saw this in, in our numerical simulations. And so this is also a practical problem for uh, bodies of uh, like FIFA or chess bodies. Mm. Also the numerics actually is quite integrated. You have these non, all these non-local operators is, is a bit uh, uh, 
you can do it, but it's a bit not easy. And then of course, this is a very simple rating model. And now there are other rating models which people use uh, also in online gaming a lot, like the, the Glico rating that for example, also uses uh, the very, not only the outcome of the games, but also the vari variability of the outcomes. So whether you are consistently winning uh, or you are somehow lucky sometimes and, and then you lose again. So, so one could also try to extend these things to, to these more complicated ratings. All right, so I'm a bit fast today, but uh, I'll leave you with a few references. So these are the three papers that this is based on with uh, Marco and Marie, with Michael and Marie, and with Joe and uh, Marie in the most recent one. And yeah, I thank you very much for, for coming on the last day in the morning. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for a very, very nice talk. Um, I was wondering whether or not you've tried to look at the effectiveness of the ELO rating system for different, for say, a knockout type structure, where ah. or against a kind of a league type structure with kind of promotion and relegation, etc. Yeah. No. No. We we haven't done that. But maybe probably we could introduce this here with uh, via the W. Um, so we would choose that differently. But actually, are we at least in the numerics there, yeah, I think you could could easily do it. But no, we haven't haven't done that. Yeah. So it's really this. We only looked at this all all play all, or then you have somehow localized in ratings that somehow players of similar strength play against each other. But yeah, it's a it's a good suggestion because that happens, and then maybe people are knocked out early. It could happen to uh, interesting interesting things could happen. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Let me ask you a personal question. Would you use this model yourself to bet for the outcome of ah. <laughs> Well, I, um, I mean, probably not, as, as you notice, not a proper English man, so I'm not so much into betting myself. Um, but of course, I mean, it's, as I said, I mean, I was more interested into the, the foul play, so into the inverse problem. So we haven't done this here, but it's, it's clear that, uh, as we have also seen in this week, that you can use data to infer things from data and then maybe also for future data to, to observe things that don't agree with your model. Um, and you could maybe also try to forecast outcomes. And it's not something that I'm uh, into very much, uh, but I know that many people are. So I so actually have some, some students who, who gave me access to some, some databases of outcomes of all football leagues uh, in the world. It's actually freely accessible uh, if, if somebody is interested. And, and these people actually try to use this data. Uh, they're not using... This kind of kinetic model, I think, um, but they try to use the machine learning and stuff to to improve their chances in betting. I'm not sure how successful they are, though. <laughs> there are some other questions. Yeah. How do you put the stochastic in your game? Because there are some unpredictable events sometimes. I don't know if you followed, for instance, '98. I think it was. Materazzi Zidane who decided the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I mean, you have some some randomness here. So there are, have some, some random variables. Um, so so the first, of course, is that you you draw the outcome of the game is a random variable, and um, the only thing that you assume essentially that on average um, it should reflect a bit the ratings through that nonlinear function. And then also here in the learning, we have some some random changes. Yeah. So um, so there's a lot of randomness uh, in the game, but um, it's we, here we take the expectation. So it's not uh, 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 there's no randomness uh, left. So we just get the average outcome. Of course, uh, I think maybe I even had this here on the slide, but I went over it. Um, maybe I removed this, um, but um, but certainly. Um, some some form of uncertainty quantification also might also be applied here if you want to know uh, how variable these this, these outcomes are of of these ratings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let us start the second lecture of this morning given by 
Kevin John Pointer from Politecnico di Torino. And data was changed with respect to the program, but will remain. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation, actually. And uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I've learned a huge amount this week, actually. Um, I thought because this is the final Friday morning, I'd therefore kind of probably change a little bit direction and kind of go to agent-based modeling, but from a very applied setting. So there's not going to be at all that much mathematics in there. It's going to be very much driven by trying to um, use mathematics and agent-based models to um, tackle particular problems. And basically, um, uh, so, so I'm going to kind of talk about kind of problems to do with animal navigation. And this is a kind of like a fascinating problem that has, um, um, uh, you know, fascinated people for absolutely centuries and things. These kind of phenomenal journeys that various animal populations do on a very regular basis, spanning across, effectively across the entire world. And in particular, I'm going to talk about two, uh, uh, two particular types of navigation, which are both taking place in an aquatic environment, which pre presents particular challenges for navigation. So for animals that are moving through the world's oceans, you have to kind of tackle extremely strong, complicated currents. Um, so that's kind of the turbulence part of my, um, the acronym of the title. You also have very large featureless areas of open ocean as well. Um, that's kind of the emptiness part, basically, where at least from the kind of the surface, there's not really any kind of clear cues um, for the animals to use. And then what's also become particularly a problem in the last, um, particularly in the last sort of half century or so, is these are also areas that are becoming increasingly noisy as well. So there's a lot of kind of sources of anthropog anthropogenic activity that's increasing the amount of noise in the ocean, also various other forms of pollution as well. So um, I'm basically going to be, you've got these kind of challenges now for animal navigation. Now, how do animals navigate? And so this is kind of, this was kind of my opportunity, therefore, to kind of shoehorn this part into the title. Um, even though I've kind of, you know, I'm now living in Italy, uh, before that I was 20 years in Edinburgh, you can't kind of get away from your kind of childhood football club. And last year was kind of a spectacular year for me because my, my team, Luton, were promoted back to the premiership. Um, and, you know, and this kind of really is kind of part of a very extraordinary journey. Back in the 80s, they were a top division club. They were winners of the League Club one year. Um, then in 1992, they were relegated. And then from 93 to 2009, we were relegated, 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 many times down to the fifth of division, lots and lots of financial problems. But then 2014, we started to get promoted. And then over the last sort of 10 years or so, we've kind of culminated in last year, kind of getting back up to the top division, basically. So, um, you know, so it was kind of really a kind of a spectacular story, basically. Um, but this is because of now actually kind of led problems for all of the other supporters of other premiership division clubs. So all of the kind of the big clubs in places like Manchester, uh, London, et cetera, et cetera, because they now have to navigate their way to Luton, which is a relatively anon anonymous little town in um, just outside sort of London, basically. And how are they going to do that? How do they kind of do that journey? Well, they've got various sort of cues that they could use. They could na navigate down a population density gradient. So um, stadiums in Manchester, Liverpool are about 80,000. We can only fit 10,000 people to, into our ground. So you could move down that population density gradient. You could also move down a financial inequality in gradient as well. Um, the, the teams assembled by all of these clubs are about a billion. Our, our team was put together with about five million pounds, basically. Or, of course, you could also move up the moral superiority gradient, basically. So all of those other clubs represent all of the kind of the big bad evils of modern football. Luton is where the real true spirit of football still lives, basically. So, And that would be the, the kind of the way to get to Luton anyway. But anyway, essentially, what that, what, what that kind of shoehorned uh, slide was to kind of show was that, of course, in order to navigate, 
Animals are using lots and lots and lots of different sort of cues. In fact, we also use lots and lots of different sort of cues. They use ba things based on visual information. They use inf auditory information. They use kind of smell or factory information and a whole bunch of other cues, possibly many others that we also still don't know about basically. And they use those in order to find the target that they're trying to get to basically. And all put together, that's what we can then call the inherent information landscape, which basically you can be, think of it as some sort of vector field, which is going to give you sort of directional information in order to get to some location and hence kind of allow those, um, th th those individuals to navigate, basically. Okay, so what sort of models do we use? Well, the models that we're very much based on are, we kind of heard about them earlier this week when um, Benoit and when Martina were talking earlier this week. They're these velocity jump random walk models, basically, where you kind of assume your individuals move through runs and tumbles. I'm going to be talking about whales and turtles later, basically. So we've got either whales and turtles. They move in a sequence of runs, tumbles, and make these kind of occasional reorientations. I'm going to look in 2D here because these individuals, for the most part, stay on the surface of the ocean basically we formulate these in a relatively simple way but of course you don't have to you can kind of put as much complexity into these models as possible um and basically then your kind of motion is just an absolutely straightforward um equation um for each sort of particle and the key thing really in terms of incorporating navigating information into this is that each time you choose a new direction, you choose some, uh, you choose with some probability based on a von Mises distribution, um, according to some kind of um, 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 dominate dominant direction, your location parameter, and with some sort of strength to how strong that cue is, basically. So that's the kind of the basic sort of framework that we're using um, to model our kind of movement sort of processes. But of course, we're also doing this then in a, oh, sorry, and I should just say actually, is that then the inherent information field, that navigation field, is then really is then what's kind of selecting these sort of two parameters for this um, uh, probability distribution for choosing the new direction. Okay, so, so that's the basic underlying model that we use. And then of course, because we're now in an ocean environment, you have to kind of put some sort of flow field on top of this as well, but that's fairly straightforward enough. You add some sort of external flow field as well. Um, and then of course that kind of actually sort of like then, you know, puts in sort of a little bit of kind of an extra sort of um, aspect into this because it then kind of distinguishes different types of heading for your individuals. The intended heading is the heading that you would want to move in based on the inherent information you have. Your actual he heading of course then can be, is then going to be sort of shifted due to the kind of the ocean currents. So, and we'll come back to the importance of that later on. So that's kind of our underlying model. And the kind of the advantage of this is that there's kind of a, lots of sort of tools out there that allow you to kind of write down for, at least for kind of independent swimmers, um, macroscopic models for the population density. Um, they, they, they kind of, they, you can kind of derive these based on various sort of approaches. You kind of get drift anisotropic diffusion type equations to describe the population density for this. And of course, these kind of advection and diffusion t tensor coefficients um, can be all kind of calculated according to what you're choosing for that kind of, um, that, for that reorientation sort of process. So it allows then that kind of direct connection between the individual model and the subsequent macroscopic model. Okay, so my kind of first application, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. It's all to do with the problem of sea turtle homing. Um, so sea turtles have a um, very long life, about, you know, typically, well, if they're lucky, they have a very long life, about 60, 70 years or so. And they start their life basically um, as a kind of a nest of um, eggs that are on, on some beach somewhere. Um, after about 50, 60 days, those hatch. And I think probably a lot of people will have seen the nature documentaries on these sort of process. You suddenly see all of these little uh, baby turtles suddenly emerging from the, from the nest where the uh, female has laid the eggs. And then at that point, that's where they really have to suddenly race as fast as possible. They have to get into the ocean as quickly as possible because you've got predators from the top, 
predators from the land coming along and picking them off um, so they kind of get there as quickly as possible. And then once they, if they manage to kind of do that, they spend, then spend 20 or 30 largely mysterious years floating around the ocean, growing in size, before then at least the females return to the same beach where they were born. And then in the, once they kind of back to that same beach, lay eggs um, and carry on then doing this, typically every three or four years or so for the rest of their life, basically. So this is then actually, a, you know, say a kind of a, um, a really actually phenomenal navigation problem when you think about this, this return to the same beaches, because a lot of locations for these nesting beaches are incredibly remote islands. And one of the most famous ones for green turtles is Ascension Island in the middle of the Atlantic. It's about 10 kilometers in distance. So these turtles, after all of these years, have to find their way back to that island. And of course, they don't have a smartphone that allows them to kind of tell them how to do that. They've got to rely on um, whatever kind of cues that they use. OK, so we kind of we looked at this quite a long time ago, actually. Um, I'm not going to talk about this sort of too much uh, in detail and stuff, um, but you shouldn't base your research on Finding Nemo. You know, Finding Nemo is certainly, you know, we have kind of migrating turtles in there, and they kind of seemingly migrate in these big collective groups together. But that's actually pretty well a kind of a lie. These turtles navigate on their own. So there's no evidence at all for any sort of collective navigation. So consequently, we've got a population of effectively individual navigators trying to get their way back to the island. So, um, so but consequently, anyway, we, you know, we can kind of do that with our kind of framework. We model that. We have give them some sort of swimming ability, some sort of navigating ability. And in particular, the sort of experiments that we try to reproduce are these ones that the, um, the experimentalists do, where they kind of go, they take turtles that are nesting on the island, they return them to the ocean maybe 100 kilometers away, and then they try and sort of follow their ability to get back to the island, basically. So we can kind of replicate those sort of um, um, simulations. You can simulate them for all, you know, for different sort of swimming and navigating abilities. And, um, and then, you know, this is kind of my green is my individual model. The kind of color map is my continuous population model. And you get a nice kind of good match between the two. And of course, you can investigate then the success of this process, basically. So we do those sort of simulations for this sort of problem. And then basically, when you kind of do that, you kind of, you're able to kind of then get some sort of map of um, the ability to navigate. Um, um, so according to the strength of the cues that they're responding to against their kind of swimming sort of speed sort of direction, you kind of get a sort of like a division of the plane into those. And because you've got the continuous model as well, you can kind of actually, you know, get an analytical approximation for that to see how that depends. And you can sort of do a certain amount of analysis using fairly straightforward stability type analysis on this problem. Okay. But the kind of the key message that I, that I kind of wanted then to say from this is that then actually, when we actually kind of did this and then started to try and fit it to the best es estimates that we could come out for the various sort of parameters, we actually seemed that we were right on the threshold of whether or not these individuals were actually going to be able to do this journey or not. Our parameters were somewhere within this region where maybe it indicated that they don't necessarily have um, a lot of success or not guaranteed success for this. And that seemed a bit worried, but worrying because you would expect them to be able to kind of get um, back to the island. They they clearly do. They you know they all kind of get back, and you get new 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 nesting sites every sort of year or so. But when we actually then looked at the various studies around this, this indeed do, does seem to be reflected in the real world as well. They do these displacement experiments, and for example, and a lot of the times the turtles that they've displaced don't find their way back to Ascension Island. There's a turtle here that they're tracking here. Ascension Island is this dot in the middle. It gets within 30 kilometers of the island, but can't find it and eventually return, eventually gives up, basically. So it does indeed seem to be that these turtles 
are not really as good a navigators as we may expect them to be. Probably there's some sort of system where at least enough of them are able to kind of get back to the island or so. Okay. So, so as I say, you know, kind of that study of turtles re revealed that actually maybe navigation is not as perfect as we should be. And that seemed to kind of like a bit unfair on these poor turtles. So at that point, actually, I thought, well, you know, I need to kind of get inside the mind of a turtle and see what sort of problem that they are actually sort of um, facing here. So I decided to start doing some s sort of self-experiments in order to kind of look at this. And fortunately, I can go down to Marina di Ragusa each summer, basically, where we kind of spend a little bit of time during August. And that gives me access to a nice big swimming area, which has got, you know, off the beach where you've got kind of complicated currents, et cetera. And in this sort of environment, there's sort of various sort of buoys that they use to kind of mark where the where the boats are allowed to go, et cetera. So I decided to see if I kind of start at one buoy and then swim to the other one, what sort of, you know, how, how, how perfectly can I do that sort of journey? And in particular, how well can I do that journey if I reduce my navigating information? Okay, so I needed to do this. Um, I didn't have a big research um, budget, so I couldn't afford a smartphone in order to track my journey, but I could at least buy a waterproof cover for my mobile phone anyway, so that was, that kind of, that kind of allowed me to um, track my kind of route as I was swimming. Um, but when I first did that, um, this was my first journey, and I, I was kind of swimming between two locations. It seemed to suggest that I had somehow jumped onto land at a certain point, but this is actually because of submergence issues. The moment your GPS goes underwater, you don't get a signal, basically. Um, with turtles, what they do, therefore, is kind of attach an antennae on the top so that when it does go to the surface, it will send a signal, basically. Um, my solution to that was basically then to steal my wife's beach hat and tie my mobile phone to the top. So that was kind of a you know, again, a kind of an inexpensive solution to this sort of problem. So I did that. Um, the next problem was that actually um, Sicilian summer beaches are very crowded as well. So you feel a bit self-conscious if you start going out swimming in the ocean with your mobile phone attached to your head on the top of a beach hat, basically, um, particularly when there's probably various family members around as well. Um, so then uh, my kind of solution to that was to swim early in the morning while everyone is still sleeping, which fortunately in Sicily in the summer is right up until about, you know, 12 o'clock actually effectively. So, you know, it's, but you know, I was, I was going out at seven o'clock in the morning basically in order to do this. And then I also had the problem of how to kind of um, um, reduce the information. Um, so my control case was just to keep my eyes open the entire way, but then to reduce my information, I decided to start swimming with my eyes shut and alternating it basically where I'd keep my eyes shut for about 40 seconds, open them briefly for two seconds and carry on in that sort of pattern. So I was reducing that information along the journey. And it takes, you know, you, you have to have a lot of willpower in order to do this when you're swimming out in the sea, it must be said. Okay, so I did that. I did my first route. Um, that was my first journey. That first route I chose was a bit ambitious. It was about almost 340 meters, but I wanted to do this four or five times. That was going to be three kilometers. And moreover, I went out quite deep and kind of found myself in the middle of a jellyfish swarm. So um, I decided that was a little bit overly ambitious. Um, you, know, you know, swimming blind in strong currents, deep jellyfish infested waters early in the morning. Uh, and actually, you know, you know, at that point, my seven-year-old son told me to stop doing this. You know, it was clearly so. And if you're told off by a seven-year-old, then, you know, you really know you're doing something wrong, basically. Uh, so I chose a less ambitious sort of route, basically. And, of course, you know, what, what I kind of very quickly encountered, that the moment I reduced the amount of information, then my journey got lot worse, basically. You were constantly being pulled around by the ocean currents that was taking you off route, basically, and consequently, you know, you, you, you couldn't do that. So, as I say, it's clear that, um, you know, it's clear that it's sort of um, difficult in order to do this. So how could I, of course, do better? Well, that kind of then brings me 
to the collective part of this um, talk, because in a lot of instances of ocean navigation, individuals are swimming in some sort of group, and that's believed to give some sort of benefit to your ability to navigate, um, the idea of kind of um, group-based benefits. Okay, so, so kind of for our, our kind of next iteration of the model, we're going to have sort of come up with a model for collective navigation. And for each member, we have assumed two principal information sources. You again have this sort of um, um, inherent information that you're getting from guidance cues, et cetera, et cetera. So all of those things that we were already assuming for the turtles. But now I kind of add on top of that some sort of collective um, um, information model, and in particular, it's kind of based on a kind of an al alignment, a Vishek type sort of idea. I mean, it's not quite a Vishek sort of model, as I'll explain in a moment, but basically, where is it, say, you look over your surrounding region, you look at the headings of all of those neighbors, and you, um, you try and sort of choose an alignment according to that, basically. So that's kind of the model is now kind of builds in these kind of two different parts to the process. And the kind of the, the, the kind of the first you know, thing to test then was really this sort of idea of the wisdom of the crowd that the averaging through the group some reduces your uncertainty and that helps to improve your navigation performance basically. So you can test that very very quickly. You can take this sort of model where you've got either con collective navigators or individual navigators, and you then kind of do those two simulations. And indeed, what you kind of do with this is that you kind of see it kind of becomes more apparent over time here that my collective navigators are more directed towards the target. They're kind of reaching it further. And the group also remains a little bit more cohesive as well. There's, you know, even though there's no explicit attraction coming in, that kind of common alignment is kind of helping to kind of keep them together in various sort of ways. So, so they kind of they, this basic idea of the wisdom of the crowd sort of works. We wanted to kind of investigate this a little bit more um, thoroughly. So the kind of questions that we had on this was, how does this wisdom of the crowd continue to benefit navigation according to the range of your communication? So how much um, collective information you can build in and the amount of uncertainty in that process? Um, the potential that you may have to cross areas where you have information vacuums with very low or negligible inherent information, those kind of empty regions of the ocean that I kind of talked about. And also, of course, with this kind of complex and turbulent sort of flow environment. So we wanted to kind of look at this a little bit more detail. So, so to kind of a, I, I explain the model, the model is very much based on kind of trying to come up with a sort of a simulation based model. Um, I won't go into any sort of details, but if anybody wants to um, wants to kind of um, um, ask me about that, I'm happy to sort of ask questions there. If you kind of take sort of, you know, you kind of have a lot of your kind of standard sort of Vishek sort of type model where you can bring in this alignment, group information is often encoded, uh, encoded simply based on the mean neighbor heading. You kind of average over all of those that you see, you choose that mean neighbor heading and you direct accordingly. And that kind of means that then actually, you know, whether or not you've got five neighbors or one neighbor, you know, you can effectively get the same sort of thing. It also kind of means that when you kind of do in that sort of case there, that you could get effectively the same mean neighbor heading if all of your five individuals have got a kind of fairly common alignment, but this could also give that same neighbor heading as well. And this probably isn't so plausible for animal populations, because if I looked around me and saw that everyone was kind of moving in very different directions, I'd be a little bit uncertain about whether or not I would want to take that information to guide myself. So we wanted to kind of come up with a model which would basically kind of, um, you know, effectively build in this potential uncertainty that you're getting to, that you would kind of, that you're kind of, you know, you're kind of, the, the, the information that you get from collective navigation, you're going to have less certainty if you just have a few neighbors to guide you, and more certainty if you have lots of neighbors to guide you. And similarly, you are going to have sort of less certainty if they're all going in very different sort of directions, and 
uh, more certainty if they're all kind of choosing in a fairly common sort of direction. So we wanted to kind of build a model that would kind of, you know, build in this sort of different sort of levels of certainty that you would have for this. Um, and the way we did this, basically, is a very much simulation-driven approach. We'd like to come up with a sort of more mathematically convenient sort of formulation for this. Um, but basically, what each time a turn occurs, you choose an inherent direction according to your inherent information, as before that we had for the turtles. You then observe the headings of the neighbors within an interaction range as well. Um, and then, basically, you kind of sample from a... Um, uh, from a weighted uh, from a distribution that weights these two parts together, basically, and then you kind of can choose a sort of a use kind of a maximum likelihood estimate in order to choose your direction, basically. And through this approach, we could effectively build in this um, this sort of um, this way that sort of um, um, you know the, this, the implicitly building this kind of um, certainty to um, the information from the collective navigation. Okay. Okay, so um, first part then, basically. Um, uh, let's see, what have we got? Got about 20 minutes or so, I guess. Yep, so, okay, yep, so. Okay, so for the, so the first part, basically, we just set up a completely sort of abstract case where we start my individual some distance from the target. They're far enough away that they need to do lots and lots of reorientations en route, basically, as they kind of journey this. And basically then, um, between them and the target, we considered a whole bif different sort of types of inherent information fields, so ones where you just had, say, constant uniform information, or ones where you may have to cross some sort of vacuum where you have very low information on the, the intended target direction. So uh, various sort of inherent information fields. And then we kind of varied the, uh, the perception range, which was effectively sort of the amount of collectiveness in your sort of model. So how many individuals you can see and how much you know, information you can draw from your collective um, um, information into the model. So that was kind of the setup. And the first thing we noticed then when we did that is that you, there's actually a kind of a bimodal sort of response in order in terms of the amount of collectiveness. So R is equal to zero is when I only have my inherent information. Um, this is how many individuals are, have still not found the, the, the target basically after some sort of times, so than my black dotted line there. And when you put just a very small amount of um, um, collective information, so kind of a small R value, your navigation becomes worse. So when there's kind of small amounts of collective navigation, collective information, navigation becomes worse. And then it's only as you start to build in more collectivity into this sort of model that navigation starts to benefit. So you have a critical um, amount of collectiveness when you start to get the benefits of collective navigation. And then effectively the reason for this is when there are simply too few neighbors, that effectively increases the uncertainty on the individuals um, so that they, they become less effective at swimming. And we found that across a whole variety of different sort of fields that we had this sort of phenomena going on. Okay, and there's some similar results back in uh, a paper of Codling uh, from a few years ago looking at similar, similar sort of um, findings. What about when you had to cross an information field, basically? So you have to go through some region where there's no information between you and the target. And then actually, in that sort of case, collectiveness just makes everything better. You know, any amount of collectiveness improves your navigation ability. Um, so, and again, we kind of found that for similar other sort of cases where we had some sort of void region. So why is that, basically? We wanted to investigate that, that there was this, you know, suddenly the moment you kind of had to cross any sort of empty region where there's no information, you get a benefit from collective navigation. So we investigated that sort of more thoroughly, basically, by kind of changing things like the size of the void space, et cetera, et cetera. And whatever we did, we always had this benefit coming in from the collective navigation going in this sort of case, basically, that we... Um, coming in. And the reason for this, of course, is, you know, 
by the fact that, you know, when you start to cross into a void space, you've got this ability to communicate with individuals outside. So my void is here, and let's consider this individual at this kind of point here. This one here, of course, has some sort of perception range. This individual's inside the void. That's not much sort of good there. But this one's outside the region. That has information towards the target, and that gives you then a bit of indication of where, where, where you're going to go where you're going to go. That, sort of, that information is passed to that individual and helps them guide towards the target. But this will actually still work even if you're the individual right in the middle of this where you're only communicating with other individuals inside the void because, of course, there's a kind of a bucket-type relay process going on where, in this sort of case there, those you know, you're, you're communicating with individuals inside the void, but they're communicating with individuals outside the void. So you kind of get this sort of passage of information um, from inside, from, from outside into your position inside the void, and that gives you your benefit of collective navigation. And this kind of reminded me a little bit of kind of the childhood game where, you know, kids will part, whisper into their ear, something and that will be passed through the line the message becomes a little bit more corrupted the more you kind of go through that line of individuals but still some of that still passes its way through so it still kind of manages to get through so collective navigation really has good benefits in this um to in order to kind of get through a void the next thing that we wanted to then look at was you know, this kind of, this kind of um, you know, sort of some of the effects of how flow can affect on this. Because as I mentioned earlier, the moment you go into a flow environment, your intended heading and your actual heading may not um, coincide. So, you know, as I say, you know, each individual, based on their inherent information, has an intended heading that they want to swim swimming. But, of course, there's drift on this as well, and that kind of will steer them in a slightly different sort of course. So that then kind of le le leads to the kind of question then is, you know, individuals have all different sort of possibilities of communication. You could get certain uh, animals that may be able to communicate their intended headings, others that may only simply be able to kind of pass on actual headings, or you may only, sim th th that, that's, that's all the information that could be conceived. So we wanted to then see how collective navigation benefits would change according to what type of heading information is shared. So we did, again, a simulation on that sort of case there, basically. And you get quite a big difference in that intended headings will are nearly always beneficial. Um, but now that kind of actually becomes an optimal interaction range. So it basically isn't no longer necessarily the case to collect as much information as possible. There actually becomes an optimal range um, um, for collecting um, um, uh, uh, collective information. But communicating that intended headings is nearly always is pretty well generally beneficial. But when it comes to actual headings, the parameter space where you get the benefits from collective navigation become really kind of restricted. And in fact, we found that when you start to share your uh, actual headings, there's lots of cases where it ends up being better to just simply swim as an individual in terms of improving your navigation ability, at least. Okay. So, kind of all putting that together, um, you know, in terms of this kind of collective versus individual, um, it was better to be an individual when you had very strong, complex flows and you could only perceive actual headings, or when you had very few observable neighbors. But it was better to be as a collective when you could get a lot of kind of collective information, you can perceive intended headings, and particularly when there were these kind of large region, regions of um, low inherent information, these kind of navigation void spaces. Okay, so that, that was, that's kind of that part. OK, so for the last 15 minutes or so, I want now to kind of move to then a kind of in, an even more simulation-based study. And I put this in because it's been kind of, it's, it's kind of seemed almost a law that we have to have a picture of flocking at some point in the talk, basically. I chose this one actually here because um, th this is a photographer that actually, you know, waits for the starling murmurations to take the shape 
of a bird as well. So you kind of get this sort of um, these kind of beautiful sort of um, uh, bird-like sort of shapes appearing in these. But I kind of wanted to, you know, you know, when we think about a flock, we think about kind of a group aggregated together, a flock or a herd or you know, a kind of swarm, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we think of them all kind of aggregated together in these sort of, you know, potentially very kind of beautiful sort of um, patterns and so forth. But that starts to become a little bit sort of different. You know, or, or, or we have to kind of challenge that thought when we go into an in ocean environment. And because we're only sort of 50 or so kilometers away from the birthplace of Leonardo, this is kind of a lovely kind of um, quote that he came up, the first really to kind of put this down into words, were this kind of phenomenon into words. If you cause your ship to stop and place the head of a long tube in the water and place the outer extremity to your ear, you will hear ships at a great communicate distance from you. And this is, you know, seemingly the first written sort of account of sound transmission through the water, that it has this ability to propagate a long way through the water. And of course, when you kind of go to something like a whale, whales have extraordinarily vocal, extraordinary vocal characteristics. You know, the, the humpback whales in particular, famous for their kind of singing abilities. And those songs that they produce can potentially travel long distances through the water. You know. And in fact, this is, you know, this all of this kind of goes back to kind of um, sort of work of kind of um, the kind of you know, famous sort of well co uh, conservationist and scientist Payne in the 1970s, basically. And they basically used kind of, you know, kind of bit of kind of, uh, kind of modeling based on sound propagation in water to estimate that many baleen whales could potentially communicate with other individuals hundreds or even a thousand kilometers away from them. And then that, of course, then, challenges our kind of question of what constitu constitutes a flock, because you could have a group of whales, which are all effectively individuals, but communicating with each other 100 kilometers away. So, and they may, through then the communication, still benefit from collective communication. Okay, so, so going as I say, marine soundscapes, as I say, have this particular characteristic, basically. Okay, what's then the problem for uh, animals such as whales? Well, over the last sort of 50 years or so, we've had huge increases in ocean noise levels. Across many oceans and seas across the world, decibel levels have typically gone by up by 10 to 20 decibels. That's a really very large, you know, um, decibels is based on a logarithmic sort of... Um, um, structure there, so 10 to 20 decibels is a huge level of increase in sound, basically. And that, because so many marine animals rely on sound for communication, whales, whales can't see more than about 10 to 20 meters, it's believed, but of course they can communicate through sound over many long, long distance. That has implications for many of the species that rely on the sound, and in particular cetaceans, and I kind of learned, and this is, this is kind of showing that, you know, even though I said earlier, you shouldn't do your research based on sort of child, you know, um, you know kind of child movies and um, books, etc. But I learned about this by reading this book to my um, son. It's The Snail and the Whale by Julia Donaldson, basically. And in this story, the whale gets disrupted by all of the noise from the speedboats and ends up getting beach, uh, beached um, as a problem. Fortunately, the snail actually then saves the day, so he does have a happy ending, this one. But this is actually a certain truth in this sort of thing, because since about 2000 or so, there's been numerous studies that have actually investigated this noise impact on cetaceans, and there's been a lot of cases of mass strandings which are, seem to be highly linked to extreme noise events that are happening. So it is having this kind of... You know, these the potentially significant impacts on whales. Okay, so, so what are the kind of the potential noise impacts? Well, I'd say one is reduced communication space. You know, as I said, while we often see whales as individuals, you know that you know as I kind of pointed out earlier, that kind of that kind of um, you know just because they may seem isolated, they may not be isolated from other others because they 
make these very large vocalizations. They can exceed 170 decibels. They have highly sensitive hearing, and that can lead to potentially enormous communication rates, 500 to 1,000 kilometers in some species. Um, for the minke whales that I'm going to talk about in a moment, um, you know, that you know, in a kind of a in a call, call it kind of a pristine ocean environment of where a pristine would be kind of before kind of industrial level sort of shipping and so forth, you have around 67 decibels of noise. Their communication range would be about 100 kilometers. Now, uh, kind of a, with that 20 decibel increase, their range would be just sort of around 19 kilometers, basically. So it has this kind of five, six fold um, factor of decrease in their ability to uh, over the range over which they can communicate. So that's so reduced communication space is one of the noise impacts. It's also likely to impact on their inherent information. There are other sort of guidance cues because there's a decent amount of evidence that whales um, they use sound in order to estimate their depth, and that's probably coming into their navigating information. They use they listen for environmental sound cues if they're kind of trying to navigate up to the poles. Ice cracking can be a, very, a sound cue. If they want to stay away from the shore, surf breaking, they can listen to that. And of course, another thing is that you know higher sound levels will reduce jet. It's likely also, I mean, we don't know this, of course, but it's also likely to lower their cognitive powers due to confusion. I don't think ever any, any of us, when we're trying to solve a hard theorem, go into a disco it, in order to do that, basically. It's a confusing environment, so it's likely to kind of reduce their cognitive powers. And another thing that it does is that it can actually also trigger noise avoidance sort of behavior as well, basically. Um, so this kind of happens when whales get, you know, whales can get kind of, um, if a loud noise is um, emitted from a, um, a ship, they can see the whales actually moving away. And they've also done kind of more finer analysis of kind of spatial distribution maps during and before, during and after naval activity. So um, I think, again, these are minke whales. I'm not quite sure about that anyway. But this was in a kind of a region of the ocean where there was kind of naval activities for a certain period, basically. Before the activity and after the activity, the, you know, the whales were pretty well utilizing all of the space. In the period when the activity was going on, here was the source, and they kind of shifted away from that, basically. So there's, ev there's evidence that they kind of then actually avoid these kind of high noise areas, which, again, which seems kind of logical. Okay, so You've got various sort of noise impacts. Um, and the problem, of course, is that, you know, in terms of studying whales, um, you know, again, kind of a nice quote, whales are reticent laboratory subjects. It's not easy to kind of put them in a laboratory and study them, basically, for quite obvious sort of regions. But that kind of then motivated us to set up a very much a data-driven model in order to try and model this sort of phenomenon. And so what we kind of did is we took a pop... We kind of simulated a, um, a migration route of mink whales through the North Sea from uh, sort of some feeding grounds down here up through back, back up to the North Atlantic. So a thousand kilometer journey using that same framework. We use minke whales because those are the ones that are kind of um, within these sort of waters and that helps to parameterize the model. And the region that we, we, we focused on this sort of area, the kind of the North Sea, is it's an area where you've got a lot of shipping and construction. You have complex bathymetry, but also because it's been such a kind of a, you know, widely exploited sort of area, um, you've got a lot of data, the data that we want. We've got good estimates for ocean currents. We've got noise maps, and those noise maps can be separated into a kind of effectively a natural noise, the noise that's coming typically from wind at the surface, um, but then also additional noise from shipping and activities. And of course, we've kind of got detailed bathymetry um, uh, maps as well, basically. So we put all of that into the model, and, um, and then basically what the model kind of includes is, uh, is all these sort of various things. Um, and basically, you know, for this sort of environment here, if I have a population of whales here, this group here would 
have full access to their inherent and collective information. They're far away from the land. They're reasonably far from the noise source. They, they kind of have pretty well full information. Um, an individual here that's closer to the noise is going to be a bit impacted by that and will have less collective information coming in here. An individual out here on its own will only have its inherent information. An individual that moves too close to the noise will choose another direction and avoid that. And an individual that kind of gets too close to the land will have a kind of an anti-beaching strategy. We don't, you know, and we kind of build that into the model as well. So we kind of try and build, as I say, a model that kind of, you know, provides at least a kind of what we think is a real realistic, uh, a semi-realistic way for these kind of the way as the, these, these individuals are likely to behave. And then we investigated these various sort of noise. And what we found is that all of these different noise impacts reduced the navigation information, but through different means. That kind of reduced communication increases the solitude, and you get those loss of collective benefits. When you reduce the information space, that increases their confusion and makes them more susceptible to the currents. And when you kind of, those kind of noise avoidance, it effectively starts to close down safe corridors through which they can move, and they, they can get trapped in regions of high noise if they're not careful. So in other words, all of those noise impacts have subtly different sort of impacts on the population. Now, where we're now kind of going with that sort of modeling then is you know, to basically sort of um, you know, start creating synthetic shipping sort of maps, basically. So based on kind of... Um, typical shipping routes, et cetera, kind of put that into our sort of model. And then through that, we can kind of simulate future noise scenarios. So it's kind of projected that shipping traffic will increase maybe 200 to 1,000% basically over the next years. We can uh, simulate the effect of that and then see maybe what sort of strategies you could do that would kind of help to overcome that. And one of them would be that actually you can offset those kind of high noise, higher noise from shipping by enforced slowdown zones that making the ships kind of go and therefore producing less sort of um, uh, noise. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so I want to kind of wrap up now, basically. Um, I, you know, so, so we've got various sort of ongoing things. Um, in terms of things that we want to do, we want to get a better fundamental alignment model, basically. So the model at the moment is very simulation driven. We'd like to get something that's a lot more mathematically convenient, basically. Um, so we're working on that. And um, of course, if anybody has ideas for that, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, I think there's some interesting optimization problems there, hitting time, particularly in this case of when you reach an information void, what's your best strategy? Should you change your movement strategy, change your speed, change your turning behavior in order to do that? Is the optimization according to doing this as fast as possible or conserve energy? Okay. And then another aspect that I think is very interesting is this kind of idea of kind of micro and macro pods that... So far, we've considered in, in this population all of these individuals, so each particle in an individual. But actually, a lot of the time, each of those particles could be a little local group. And that kind of raises the question that actually is kind of, you know, you've got two different sort of levels of groups, micro groups and macro groups as well. And there's possibly some sort of optimal structuring according to that. But Anyway, I want to thank you for your time. Um, this is my collaborators on this. It kind of goes through my kind of Harriet Watt phase and my Polytechnico phase. Um, so just kind of wanted to acknowledge that and then all of my collaborators. So thank you very much. Okay, so now our next speaker is Luigi Ambrosio, next and last speaker of this uh, workshop. And he will speak about variation or geometric problems involving functions with bounded Hessian. So I don't need to introduce Luigi. So for many of us, his books are Bible. Or <laughs> so, and uh, I'm very happy really to introduce his talk. Thank you. So very, thank you very much, Helen. And uh, um, I thank the organizer for the invitation. Actually, I have a, a paper with. Um, Massimo Fornassier, Marco Morandotti, about multi-agent, but maybe this starts to be a little old, I don't know. And so I prefer to speak about a topic which is maybe not so closely related, but uh, it's more recent for me. And um, 
and I hope it will have anyhow an interest for you. Um, it's basically it's a problem a little bit at the interface between calculus of variation, geometric measure theory, but also with the, uh, a flavor from applied mathematics, actually. The motivation came from, uh, from a proposal by Michael Lunzer at, uh, in, in Lausanne. And uh, in this topic, I've been working uh, in different papers with Camillo Brena, who is a PhD student here in the school, Sergio Conti in Bonn, and uh, uh, Shayan Azizinejad, who uh, has been a postdoc in, um, in Lausanne. So let me, uh, my, the plan of my talk is to start with some motivation. And then I'm going to introduce uh, the basic spaces. Uh, I will try to be self-contained, of course, uh, uh, we all know what are uh, the Sobolev spaces. And I will mention the typical variational problem we uh, people in the applied uh, literature are dealing with, but uh, mostly I would like to focus on uh, the last part, which is the, the more geometric part, which I think uh, could have also a more general interest. So, well, here there are some references, these two papers, one which is going to appear on calculus of variation in PDA, the other one on archive. And uh, if, if you are interested more in the applied side, then there are these papers in uh, machine learning research. And from the calculus of vari the variation side, uh, uh, this paper by Bredies and Carioni, uh, Chambol, Castro, Duval, uh, Bo Boyer, Weiss, and finally, also um, this uh, paper by uh, Michael Unser and collaborators. So let me start with a very informal introduction. So the, because here we work a, a lot by analogy. So in the, let's say in the theory of uh, uh, compressed assessing, which is based on Fourier series, there is this notion, important notion of sparsity. Sparsity means that when you do the expansion, only very few coefficients are relevant. So there is a kind of concentration effect at the level of coefficients. And more recently, uh, mostly with tools of convex analysis, this point of view started also to be investigated in calculus of variation problem, also in relation, as I will illustrate, in relation to problems dealing with machine learning. And uh, maybe you recognize the typical structure of problems in uh, um, optimization and machine learning. You have an energy that you want to minimize. There is a, a script A, which is a kind of projection, maybe from a big space to a finite dimensional space. And phi is a kind of regular, regularization to, to your problem, which in some sense encodes also some a priori assumption you are making uh, on the model. And then in this calculus of variation problems, uh, the, uh, the result is that basically you, you can represent the minimizers as a, let's say, convex combination, so modulo, let's say, a normalization with uh, the minimal energy as convex combinations of uh, um, extreme points, extreme points for the unit ball of the regularizing term. Phi will be always for me the regularizing term. So you, you should think of this also as a kind of small perturbation, if you like, of your problem. And then what matters here are is the geometry of the of the unit ball of phi and the, the extreme points of phi. Okay, modulo, modulo, kernels, and so on, they're just irrelevant technical comp comp uh, complexity. So uh, what is the specific, to go more specific into our problem, uh, the connection with machine learning, uh, which is typically done of these two steps. So you define a class of functions which depend on some parameter, theta. And um, let's say in the training uh, procedure, uh, you try to minimize with respect to your parameter, which uh, encodes uh, all potential class of functions that you want to consider, you minimize this energy where, uh, again, this is your energy phi, and lambda is a kind of tuning parameter that you have to choose. Uh, 
Of course, uh, this theory has been studied a lot, particularly in the linear setting. So where uh, the dependence of u on theta is linear, that will be a typical expression. But uh, now we know that uh, particularly in the last few years, uh, this approach, at least empirically, has been uh, really outpowered by uh, deep neural networks where the dependence of u on theta is not linear. It's not linear and uh, let's see how it works. So for instance, uh, it works in this way, um, in this particular model, but of course there are many others. Uh, so you, you iterate for sufficiently many times, L is the number of layers, basically two operations, a very simple uh, and linear operation. Uh, you multiply by a matrix and you add a, a drift B. But uh, uh, the, the main point is that you have a nonlinear operator, which typically could be, for instance, the positive part, uh, which acts in each step on the, on the single components of your vector. And so, in some sense, in this model, uh, the space of parameters are all these matrices and all these drifts. And you generate u theta just composing, if you like, starting also from a very simple function, a smooth function, um, or a linear function, uh, this. And uh, in some sense, the proposal uh, by Unser and his research group is to single out, in this theory, the class of CPWL functions, which are continuous piecewise linear functions, as the natural class for this model. Well, this is a, you may of course discuss the model, but if you, if you accept the model, I think that this is really the natural class because it is invariant under these transformations. If you take a positive parts or um, more similar truncations and uh, uh, it is the smallest class, and actually there are papers so showing that in this way you can really generate uh, by having sufficiently many layers, any CPWL function. So it is the smallest class invariant under these transformations. And where uh, the analogy with the L1 minimization comes from, it comes from the fact that uh, we, we might uh, uh, replace L1 um, in the in the linear theory with uh, uh, an energy um, which now I'm going to describe which is the second derivative of your function but the second derivative should be understood in the sense of measures in the sense of distributions because when you consider a piecewise a fine function of course the second derivative is almost everywhere zero it's only due to jumps in the gradient and so there is a kind of sparsity which uh, in this language, it becomes a concentration of the derivative. Okay, so now maybe I spend a little time on some mathematical preliminaries, and then I come to our, let's say, geometric results. Uh, well, this is the, uh, the Sobole space, uh, where the derivative in the sense of distribution is given by an LP function. Of course, uh, this can be iterated uh, to get uh, k derivatives uh, in the sense of distributions in LP. In our case, we need only second order derivative, but our problem is that uh, the derivatives will be measures and not functions. And so let me start with a, a space of, in which of course the, the school in Pisa, starting from the Giorgi, Tonelli has a big tradition, the space of functions with bounded variation is the space functions whose derivative in the sense of distribution is induced by a measure. And I will use D uh, to, to distinguish between the pointwise one, which is nabla, right? D will stand for distributional and it is a, a measure for BB. And then uh, uh, one can uh, study uh, the structure. This is by now well understood. Uh, at first order level, everything is completely understood. So uh, for a function u, which is BV, uh, all components, let's say that u has m components like here. And uh, so the derivative is a matrix of measures. 
uh, this matrix is well understood. It has an absolutely continuous part, which is a kind of differential. Uh, there is a, a, a jump part, which, is, which has a geometric structure. It's a tensor product of two vectors, so the direction of the jump and the, the normal to the jump. So this leaves in Rm and this leaves in Rn, the dimension of the ambient uh, omega. And then there is a mysterious part, which also will play a role somehow, which is the so-called counter part of derivative. So there are functions for which the derivative is neither jumps nor, nor absolutely continuous. It's a kind of intermediate behavior. Okay, so now uh, the space that we are going to consider is precisely a second order space, is the space of function W11. Uh, and they call this space BH, bounded hash, and this is the name in the literature, the space of functions for which the partial derivatives, all the n partial derivatives, belong to BB. This space has been studied a lot, also in connection with the mechanics, with the fracture plasticity. Um, uh, you can get uh, Sobolev embedding uh, properties, uh, uh, for instance, um, a nice fact is that uh, the sharp integrability properties do not come by iterating the Sobolev embedding. Uh, of course, by iterating the Sobolev embedding, you get informations, but uh, the sharp ones do, uh, don't use the information that uh, it is a gradient of the function, which is a derivative. And so, uh, for instance, one can show by a direct method not using Sobolev embedding that uh, in dimension two, for instance, BH functions are continuous, even if a density or smooth function fails. But what is important for me is to stress uh, the, the structure of the second derivative. Again, it will be a matrix, a symmetric matrix of measures and to define what, what are the energies that we are considering as regularizations. Um, and there is a, a famous result by Alberti saying that, uh, well, first of all, you can try, you can write this uh, in polar representation. So this is the total variation, it will be a non-negative positive, a non-negative scalar measure, HU will give in some sense the orientation and uh, and uh, by Alberti theorem, we know, like on the jump part, that uh, this part is uh, a rank one matrix. But it is a rank one matrix which has to be symmetric. And so in some sense, the orientation of, of the Hessian on the singular part is a very special structure. It's a tensor product of, of two equal vectors. And then uh, uh, this is an important piece of information. Then you can decide uh, any norm you like uh, on the space of symmetric uh, matrices and define in this way your energy, right? Just integrating the norm of HU with respect to the total variation. And particularly interesting for us will be uh, two norms in my discussion. The Schatten norm, which, which uh, has already been used uh, a lot also in the applied literature, which is the sum of the moduli of, uh, of the eigenvalues of, um, well, this is the definition for general matrices. If M is already uh, symmetric, are the eigenvalues of uh, the modulus of the eigenvalues of M. And of course, you can also choose the Euclidean norm, but we will see that for many reasons, uh, the Euclidean norm is not the right one to be considered in this problem. And so let me denote the two energies um, corresponding to uh, the Schatten norm and the Euclidean norm by phi s and phi e. Well, uh, with these energies, uh, there are a lot of nice properties. For instance, they are um, non-decreasing under uh, symmetrization and um, they are well behaved under convolutions. There are a lot of nice properties which play a role also in, uh, in our proofs. And uh, let's say the typical variational problem which is considered in the literature is, 
is this one. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, you put the lambda uh, on the other on the other term, but uh, it is the same. And so, what is the situation? Well, of course, uh, in dimension two, this problem is well posed because we have the embedding of BH inside the continuous functions. But in dimension larger than three, it, it is ill posed. In some sense, you can't, because you can't, in some sense, specify the value of U at xi uh, if uh, you have only two derivatives and you are in dimension larger than three. Nevertheless, this problem has been studied a lot in dimension one, when, of course, everything works, uh, where solutions can be exactly uh, computed by this has been done by Unser and collaborator. We have been working on the case n equal to two. Let's say that in the, in the case uh, n larger than two, formally, this problem is ill posed. What is typically done uh, is to replace here the evaluation at xi by some regularization. For instance, you can make a, short, a small convolution around, around xi and make uh, this problem well posed. But anyhow, this is not my, my goal, even if this is a kind of interesting uh, variational problem. We have been studying this, uh, let's say, in dimension two. But maybe I think it could be more interesting uh, today to focus on the geometric part of, my, of uh, our papers. And so let me go really now to the geometric part. Uh, the geometric part uh, uh, recall the definition of extreme point in a vector space. Uh, a vector is an extreme point of, for some subset S is an extreme point if you can be written as a com as a non-trivial convex combination. And there, there is also another, um, maybe less known, but also quite interesting notion, which is the notion of exposed point. Uh, exposed points are unique minimizers for linear and typically uh, also topology is, is considered uh, linear continuous functionals. And another review with a few very classical results, which I recall, uh, Krein-Milman, uh, a compact, compact convex set is the closed convex hull of the extreme points. If you are in finite dimensions, like in the results which I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, um, you of course you have a finite combination by Caratiodori theorem. And uh, uh, what is the connection between these two notions? Ex exposed points uh, are uh, clearly extreme because they are unique minimizers. But in general, except of course on the real line, um, the two notions are not equivalent. Uh, maybe uh, I can draw a small picture to, to illustrate. If you consider a kind of stadium, this point, this point of course will be an extreme point, but it will not be an exposed point. It's not, it's not a unique minimizer, right? And uh, what is interesting is, however, that uh, there's, there are still sufficiently many. So the, um, the class of exposed points are dense in the class of extreme points. And so you can state the krein milman theorem also taking the closed convex hull of um, exposed points. And as I said, the, what, what uh, at the beginning of my talk, uh, uh, the main point is to study the geometry of the unit ball of the energy phi, which is a second order energy, uh, second derivatives. So let me start with the, the uh, first order case, which is uh, well known, uh, very classical, but uh, to do the analogy, I think it will be important. So let's start with the first order. Let, let us assume that our regularization is a first order regularization. I consider all functions with total variation less than one. And then I would like to understand the, the class of extreme points. Well, I consider, I put a star because I, I consider BV modulo constants. So let's say omega is connected. So under this condition, this will be a norm in BV modulo constants. 
And then the result is that uh, it's not surprising that uh, uh, U is extremal if and only if uh, U is a constant multiple of a characteristic function, right? And uh, well, here maybe I give you a sketch of proof, uh, which is, by the way, as I said, this folklore is, is uh, classical. I think goes back to an old paper by uh, Wendell Fleming in the in the forties. Um, so clearly, a necessary condition for extremity is that you have to stay on the surface, on the boundary of the unique ball. So the total variation has to be equal to one. And you try the most obvious decomposition of your function. You truncate at the level L and, uh, and you define U2 equal to U minus U1. And then there is a, a, a formula, which is the so-called coarea formula, uh, which relates uh, the total variation, which is one to the perimeter of the super level sets and so if you call this alpha and beta, alpha plus beta is equal to one by the Quaria formula. So, so this decomposition is a good candidate uh, for a convex combination. And so you do exactly this. And if you are extreme, this means that uh, V1 should be equal to V2, which means if you remove the scaling uh, coefficients that uh, these two functions have to be parallel proportional, maybe that is not the right word, they have to be proportional, which means that they have the same level sets. And then since L is arbitrary, the only possibility, since the intermediate level is arbitrary, the only possibility is that U is a constant of a characteristic function. But then of course, E could be uh, disconnected, right? And in this case, we are lucky because there is a beautiful uh, theorem by Federer which provides really in a measure theoretic setting the notion of connectedness, like uh, any open set is a countable union of connected components. In this setting, one can prove that any set with finite perimeter, I mean, whose characteristic is BB, is, uh, can be written as a finite or countable union of indecomposable components. And then uh, the indecomposable components of V are precisely the extreme parts. So let's say the first order case is completely understood. Now let us go to the second order case. In this case, we have to work with the BH star, which is BH modulo affine functions. And what we, we would like again to understand the extreme points of S. And let's see, for instance, well, in, in dimension one, there is no surprise. I mean, in dimension one, the extreme points are exactly the piecewise uh, affine functions, right? And of course, the higher, the problem which were, was raised by Unser is uh, what are the higher, what happens in dimension higher than one? And the good candidates are, called, are of course, the piecewise um, continuous piecewise affine functions. Uh, so before coming to the result, uh, what we expect on this problem? Well, we expect more rigidity because uh, second order problems are typically more rigid than first order problems. Uh, think to the fact that not any vector is a gradient. This is already a source of rigidity. And, look, and this will be particularly important also for us. We have a freedom in the chase of the norm when we are dealing with vector value problems and the choice of the norm will be relevant actually. And so the questions that we try to understand is, uh, uh, can we characterize, uh, let's say, let's stay for the moment only inside the CPWL functions. Can we characterize uh, those, fun among those functions, uh, those who are extreme? Well, this is possible. Um, basically, there is a kind of notion of connectedness of the support of the derivative. Um, this is not uh, surprising. Even if I would like to, uh, to see if uh, there is an analogous characterization also for the, for the stronger notion, the one uh, 
I was mentioning of exposed. But uh, the most difficult question that we attack is whether is it still true as in dimension one that uh, all the extreme points are necessarily a fine, piecewise a fine. And actually we discovered that to our surprise that uh, the answer is no. So if you take uh, just a, a radial function in more than one dimension, kind of truncated cone, uh, then you normalize it, then all these functions are extremal. And uh, the proof is not, not elementary. This uses a lot of information about the structure of the derivative and so on. And again, an open problem, which I don't know, is whether uh, whether these functions, which are not extremal, uh, which are extremal, the truncated cone, are also exposed. Uh, proving that something is exposed is really requires a, co a construction, right? Because you have to exhibit a functional for which this is a unique minimizer. And for the moment, this is a, an open problem. Okay, so in some sense, uh, uh, the answer is uh, disappointing from the applied point of view because it shows that uh, in, uh, the extreme points, the class of extreme points is larger than expected. But then we try to attack, let's say, an intermediate question because after all, in crime milman theorem, um, we take uh, the closure. So we ask ourselves whether CPWL functions or extreme CPWL functions uh, are dense. And uh, the density question can be stated in, in this way. So in some sense it's dense, not in a weak topology, but uh, we have to, to study density in a topology which takes into account uh, you, you, the geometry. So the fact that you, you are in the unit ball and in particular you are, made, let's say, on the surface of the unit ball. So what we need is convergence in energy. So let's say you would like to approximate any function u with the CPWL functions, let's say in a weak topology, L1 or LP, but with the uh, convergence of the energy, the so-called density in energy. And this is, I think, a beautiful uh, uh, problem uh, in uh, calculus of variation. Let's see why, where the difficulties come from. Okay, by scaling, you can assume that, let's say, all the energies are equal to one. And uh, whenever you approximate uh, in L1, you have always the limit inequality. So in some sense, it is easy to spend more energy to approximate, but the difficulty of the problem is to spend as little as possible energy, which means proving the lean soup inequality. Huh? And... Uh, the first observation is that actually this is not a problem at the level of no smooth functions. You can assume without any loss of generality that your target function is smooth. If you're able to do the approximation for a smooth function, you're able to do this for any function because these energies are, um, are decreased under convolutions. And here, in this, in this uh, part, comes uh, the fact that, however, the choice of the energy is crucial for this question. And in some sense, also, our result also motivates the choice of the Schatten norm also in the applied literature. Uh, so first, first of all, let me start by saying that if the question for, not for the Schatten energy, but for the Euclidean energy had the positive answer, then we will have the positive answer for any other energy. Because there is a beautiful theorem by, um, by the Russian mathematician Reshetniak who proved that because of strict convexity, as soon as you converge for phi, you converge for any other phi. However, uh, uh, maybe I, I skip a little bit this part. One can prove that the answer for the phi is, is no. So it is not possible to do uh, the approximate. Here you will find the explanation. I, I'm, I'm running a little bit out of time. So, um, anyhow, what can prove that for the Euclidean 
for the Euclidean energy, this approximation in energy is impossible. And uh, yeah, this is the explanation. The basic idea is that uh, the two energy Schatten and, and E differ with the strict inequality, let's say already on quadratic functions. Okay, so we have to attack the problem precisely for the Schatten energy. We can't work with the, um, or other similar energies, let's say, which are not so strictly convex, so to speak, like uh, the Euclidean distance. And so in the first paper with, um, okay, first of all, let me explain how you can get the result without a big effort, without a big effort, but paying, that will not be optimal because you pay a multiplicative constant C larger than one. Well, this result works uh, basically with any reasonable strategy because uh, you can assume, as I said, uh, without loss of generality that your target function is smooth. Then you can do kind of canonical Lagrange interpolation and eventually you estimate the energy in the canonical Lagrange interpolation with let's say standard uh, simplexes, but eventually you find the constant which results uh, basically from the Poincaré inequality. Uh, but uh, this constant, you can't control it. Uh, you can't push this constant to one. So how you can, you can try to get uh, C of n equal one, of course, this is also well known in calculus of variation, also in numerical analysis, you have to adapt. Uh, so you can't choose a priori the geometry, but you have, you have to adapt the geometry to the local behavior of the function. In particular, you have to use, you have to use locally frames where uh, the action of u, as I said, we are already reduced to the case where u is uh, smooth. Uh, you have to use frames where u is close to a diagonal. But of course, then they have a problem because uh, uh, you have to, again, you have to keep to under control the, ge the generation of the geometry or show that maybe the, the simplexes, uh, which are maybe on the boundary, whose geometry that generates uh, give a small contribution can be discarded. Okay, so in the first paper, which is uh, with uh, Brena Ziznejad, we got the result or, or only in dimension two. And I will illustrate to you only this result actually, because it can be explained in a few lines and is using a, a self-similar construction. So, so let, let me uh, maybe illustrate the idea with a few pictures. So first of all, you know that the deviation of you is uh, smooth. So you decompose, let's say your space in many, in many uh, squares this will be one of these squares. And you know that inside this square, the action of you is almost constant, okay? This means that since the action of you inside this square is almost constant, and this will be true for all the other squares that I'm not putting in the picture, inside this square, you have a frame, which is this tilted frame here, where the action of you written in, in the tilted coordinates will be diagonal. And then uh, if you use this geometry to do the Lagrange interpolation, you don't lose anything. You get uh, the sharp constant. The problem is uh, how to iterate this procedure uh, because eventually you will have a kind of boundary problem because of course in the neighboring uh, cubes, you will have different frames different orientations, right? Uh, anyhow, in dimension two, we are lucky uh, because um, let's say at the second step, let's say you already did here in, inside the this square, what we did here. So, so, and now it happens that however you can do, you can continue in this way. For instance, uh, let me work on this triangle and for the other, uh, uh, for triangles, it will be exactly the same. So let us focus on these triangles. We already created a grid here. I want to create the grid here. And again, I can use this rectangle here. 
and I do the same also here, and I remain with uh, these two small triangles. Uh, the nice fact of this construction is that uh, it's cell similar can be iterated, and so there is some control on the geometry which makes uh, the proof uh, eventually work with the uh, with constant one. And uh, for some time uh, we had no clue um, on how to do this uh, uh, in dimension larger than one, and then uh, came uh, into the um, into the subject uh, Sergio Conti in Bonn which showed us uh, uh, this uh, completely different strategy of doing uh, the triangulations. And eventually we, are, we, we got the result more recently also in any number of dimension. Uh, and eventually what is the consequence of this result? We can restore in some sense a kind of positive result for the model of uh, Unser and collaborators. So we are able to prove that uh, all extreme points of the unit ball are still limits of uh, CPWL functions. And so even if not all extreme points are uh, CPWL, it is still true that uh, this set is the closest uh, convex hull of extreme uh, CPWL functions. And I think with this, I can stop here and I thank you for the attention. I will see. Much Luigi. Are there some questions or remarks here, please? Oh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you if you have if you have some information about the invertibilities of these uh, uh, optimal um, functions. Pardon, uh, about the the invertibility of the optimal uh, function. Not the invertibility, so the, uh, if they are one to one or something like this, if you can. But you mean for the something. gray? No. Uh, so our functions are scalar. Ah, ah okay. Uh, so our functions are scalar from an n dimensional domain to a, a scalar. Oh. Functions are scalar. So, so maybe, yeah, it could be raised the question at the level of the gradient, mm -hmm. maybe maybe at the level of the gradient, like in optimal transport. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I oh. never thought about this. Are there some more questions? Thanks, Luigi. I'm just wondering if there's any moral reason to why the shut norm works, kind of, and not the other. Yeah, norms. in some sense, okay, already our theoretical result shows that um, or this kind of energy, if you want to really to get the sharp approximation, the shut norm uh, is, is, is a good one. Is maybe not the only one. In fact, this is an open problem to try to characterize all norms for which uh, you can do the sharp approximation. And we know that uh, anyhow, if a norm is uh, enough uh, uniformly convex, like uh, the, the Euclidean norm, there is no hope. Um, but I have to say that in the applied literature, uh, using this analogy with L1, uh, they already were suggesting this uh, this choice. I mean, in the applied community, it is already considered to be the right object. But uh, I, I have to say, from the mathematical point of view, one of the questions uh, which also Camillo Brena is trying to work is uh, is uh, what is the characterized the class of norms, right? If I may add some question, is anything known, probably this could be interesting also at the level of first order problems about vector valued functions? Yeah, this is another question, of course. Yeah, you can remove, you can still be second order, but uh, uh, no, sorry, you, you, you are first order, but not gradients, right? No, this I don't know. Yeah, this, that, but th that could be a reasonable, also direction, right? Because this is related to your model. In this model, uh, U is thought as a scalar function, but uh, maybe in some other models, it will be very natural to consider U as a vector value function, right? Yeah. And but the second order, however, is related to this question of concentration of derivative. If you want a derivative uh, of a fine piecewise of fine functions, still you need the second order. But you could do second order for vector value, for instance, right? Yeah. 
And this is not directly achievable with the methods you have? No, no, I don't think so. So maybe with the method, uh, one has to revisit the method, but uh, it will, will not be just a corollary because it, it, you, need, uh, yeah, you can't really argue component-wise. Uh, no. That's the point, because also when, when well, looking unless... at your proof in the, first, in the first order case, which is based on Coera formula, yeah. clearly you can do it component-wise, but when you have norms, uh, okay. you may... Of course, unless you define your phi energy as the sum of phi energies of the components, but that you will lose all the geometric um, formation, right? Are there some uh, more questions or remarks? Luigi, what would be the advantage to work with exposed points rather than extremal points? Well, uh, I, yeah, so also this is a good question. No, I am, uh, let's say, I, I can't answer from the, the applied point of view from the Mathematical point of view, I find this this notion very intriguing. Uh, I discovered it, and uh, I thought that there is very little about this because typically one considers extreme, and uh, and also what I like is that inside this notion there is a kind of constructive part, like in the theory of calibrations, right? To build a, a minimizer to to show that. Uh, some in some calculus operation problem uh, an object is a minimizer you have to build the calibration if you are in a non-convex setting so there is this nice uh, constructive character that uh, i like uh, also because you know for the truncated cone we have a very complicated proof really complicated is using a lot of geometric measure theory but maybe if you guess uh, what is the the functional maybe you get uh, a very short proof to make an analogy for the minimality of uh, the Simon's cone, you remember the original proof by the Giorgi um, Bombieri Giusti was very deep, very long, uh, but eventually with calibration, now there are papers which are uh, two proofs which are two pages long, but you had to device <laughs> the right object, right? Thank you. Some more questions? Okay, so let us thank uh, Luigi uh, for this nice talk. Let me also use the micro to thank warmly the organizers for this very successful workshop. And <laughs> so, <laughs> good trip to everybody back to your. So thank you very much. And uh, so let's say on behalf of the organizers, I would like to thank all of you participants and speakers as well for the success of this week together and for the uh, mixture of the three different communities that we thought of, more analytical one, uh, numerical analysis, analysis one, and also the mathematical physics community. <laughs> mathematical physical. Right, right. Mathematical physical community. Um, so it was a pleasure to have you here. And uh, really, thank you very much. And uh, safe trip home to your institutions.